welcome. We're so excited to bring this next guest to you. Reverend Tiffany Barsotti is a master in theology, and you may have seen her on Gaia TV shows with Regina Meredith, where she's been sharing her wisdom on the science and the practice of healing. Tiffany is a spiritual and medical intuitive counselor, and she's also a subtle energy specialist. She's conducted research and has been a mentee of Norm Sheely and Carolyn Miss, and many more. She's forwarded frontier research in biofield science, and she's a really deep practitioner of what she calls Know Thyself Tools, which she shares with others to achieve clarity of life purpose, spiritual maturity, and healing the psycho, spiritual, emotional, energetic root causes of illness. Tiffany, thank you so much for sharing your time and your wisdom with us today. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. <laughs> Love it. You both. Tiffany, I get the pleasure of asking you the first question for this interview. I know you've served as a, as a medical intuitive and also a spiritual healer for many, many years. And given this summit, the topic is the science of healing. I'd like you to begin by sharing with us your thoughts. What exactly is healing to you? What have you seen in all the folks you've been working with over the years? What is healing? Hmm. I love the question and I love the topic of this whole summit. Uh, I think very few people have actually really gotten into these kind of depths. So what I see it as is the body's ability to return to a state of equilibrium. And ideally, uh, really our bodies can do that on its own. And sometimes we just may need a little nudge and the energy healing is one way to get a nudge. Um, but many lifestyle changes can do so many things to shift our, our perception, our lifestyle in relationship to our food, our environment. So I really see healing as the body's ability to return to a state of equilibrium. There's a scientific word that is salutogenesis, which is all about exactly that, returning to the state of regeneration. And you speak about pillars to health, these pillars to healing, pillars to health and well-being. And Tiffany, I know in the deep work that you've done in the decades of work, you know, as a practitioner helping others heal, you've uncovered these pillars. Can you tell us a little bit more about them? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, many people have put these pillars of health out there. Deepak, I actually just built some of some additional ones based on Deepak's um, seven pillars of health. And really the, the commonality, I'll just list them, um, sleep hygiene, meditation and stress management, movement, yoga, pranayams, emotional hygiene or emotions, being aware of your emotions, nutrition and nourishment, regular detoxification, biological rhythm, rhythms and grounding, environment, meaning less or few or no chemicals ideally, and get outside as well as our energy hygiene, meaning more subtle energy hygiene. And self-awareness, uh, Deepak uses the word metahuman. And just to say a little bit more about what a metahuman is, is the ability to go beyond. It's part of that having that self-awareness to go beyond the constructs of what might be happening exactly in, that, in the moment that could be causing an unrest. Uh, social well-being and sexual health. So I've added four more to those seven and uh, I'm happy to create that for uh, the shift listeners to have as a reference with a little paragraph that goes with each one, like what do I mean to unpack it? So these are all lifestyle, which is interesting. It's lifestyle and it's also sort of interoceptive awareness as we like to call it in the scientific world is a fancy way of saying tuning into our bodies, right? And you know, I'll just share, Tiffany, sometimes I joke around and I say, you know, we Western scientists make things really complex. And like, you know, sometimes when I see those graphics of like, whoa, there are 11 things and like, there are all these things I've got to do, like it causes anxiety in me. And then I have to come back to realize, oh, well, wait a minute, my well-being stems from the well of my being. And so all of these things that you just mentioned, sleep, hygiene, emotion, subtle awareness of the body, nutrition, all these things aren't really that complicated. I don't actually almost have to seek out to get them and get some formula, but if I'm really working with the well of my being, then my body is a temple, right? And I begin to kind of explore this. So 
I know that you know this well, and you teach this often to people. And you've mentioned, you know, the subtle energy awareness. So I'm just wondering, what kind of role do you feel that this awareness of the body and, you know, kind of diving into understanding what our body is telling us, how important mm -hmm. do you think that is in our in our health and well being? I think it's imperative. And to when often when I'm teaching on this topic, I will say that really awareness is the first and the most important thing. Actually, willingness. The willingness is is like sort of somebody being here and being part of this conversation and this this um, exchange that you know we have our own minds to think about things and to interact in in a community in this way. So having a willingness to even go there. And then the next thing is the awareness piece that you just spoke to. And it's really the essential, but awareness can be a little bit annoying too. It's like, oh, I did it again. You know, I, I ate that whole pie or I, I got angry too fast or, you know, whatever. I, I'm just being light about it. But you know what I mean when we are um, being self-aware about the things that are causing an unrest. So the more aware of, that we are, and I appreciate the metaphor of the well of our being as the temple, as the thing to nourish and nurture, then our body is giving us messages all the time. And it, our job, I believe, is to get really much better about interpreting those messages. And that's part of the steps of self-healing. I actually believe that all healing is self-healing. That, so I have to ask a question about that because uh, many people do have awareness of these things, and many people they have a, a willingness too. But 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 many people still don't heal. So I can't help but ask the question: Well, why is that? Those are two fundamental ingredients. There's some other things that people need in that list, or something outside of that list, to really get them into the transformation of healing. So so what else? What else is needed? When I'd like to answer the question in this way is to say that when a person isn't healing for even though they may say that they really want to, there's often still things like the gift to still unpack the information that's there. What's the reason that the, this illness or this imbalance has come into our lives? And how can we get our ourselves to recognize those subtleties that are, you know, the reason for the cause. And also a lack of forgiveness is a really big one. People love to hang on to a story and there's a righteousness in that and it prevents healing oftentimes. So those are really key points that I see come up a lot as well as secondary gain. Secondary gain in psychological terms means that there's somebody, uh, that person is having a, a, an additional benefit for why it is that they may stay attached to healing, such as um, if a person stays sick, then they're getting attention from somebody. And, and so that might be the only way that they know to get attention. That's just a, an example of secondary gain. Tiffany, this idea of secondary gain is really interesting. It seems to me that you're almost kind of suggesting that there are some aspect of our subconscious sometimes that we may not even be fully aware of that could be impeding our healing progress and is that right is, it, is that kind of the way you see it or yes i i do um even the the idea with secondary gain as a sometimes an unconscious process i mean you wouldn't necessarily think that you're choosing to block yourself from healing when you're asking for something genuinely but there's an unconscious process that, that could be playing also. And oftentimes it's because there are fears that have not been dealt with yet. Like if a person really gets on their path, what does it mean to be well? Means that, uh-oh, now I really have to show up for my life. Now I have a journey in front of me that is so big, but I'm really scared to put myself out there or, you know, whatever. And so there's subconscious selves. And this really builds on the work, uh, you know, Carl Jung had spoken about the animus anime, um, really looking more details into the male and the female aspects, which is hugely important. And the, the work of personal self-integration is a, a little bit more of a modern, just sort of taking into a lot of the 
ancient practices, which is interesting because when I got into studying personal self-integration and exactly what that is, and I'll unpack that in just a moment, is that I found roots to the Egyptian ways of teaching about the inner self or subconscious aspects. I found roots in Sri Aurobindo's teachings, in Rudolf Steiner, in Teresa of Avila, Jesus's teachings, teachings on many mansions, uh, the Huna tradition, it's a shamanic tradition, which is where Ho'oponopono comes from. It's just, they, they speak of these subconscious selves or these parts or psychic beings. It seems like all of these different cosmologies have had a different way of putting the same thing. And to me, that's truth. And so to unpack that a little bit more, what am I meaning by these selves is, yes, we talked about male and female self and many of us are already familiar with that. Thank you, Carl Jung and others. But there's also the mental judge self, the astral judge self, the body self, the high self and the outer self. Now, the mental judge self is an aspect, you could say almost like an archetypal kind of representative of all of the field of the mind. And the astral judge self is the same thing, but representing more of the emotional body and the content and the information that's held there. So it's a collective of all of our experiences and whether or not you believe in past life or reincarnation, that plays a role in, into this as well, because a lot of the, you will find root information. And even if it's not in a person's worldview of reincarnation, it doesn't matter. We all have been on this sort of earth's recycling program for 5 billion years, if, if that's the right number. And, and so we've got a lineage where we've come from. And so we've built up a certain amount of information, emotional storage. You know, many people talk about this transgenerational healings and things like that. Well, a lot of this information are stored in these, these sort of fields around the body, but in the, the memories of these subconscious selves. And the outer self personality, the body self is somewhat, you can figure that out. And high self is pretty self-explanatory. But the outer self is like us, the outer self, the personality, the one that is on the leading edge, taking our, our life journey and making the decisions or not making the decisions that are coming up for our, our journey. Like, are we actually doing the things that we're supposed to be doing in, in our lives according to our soul's purpose? I strongly believe that we all have a mission and to get comfortable with where that mission is and whether or not we are living it, to me, I, I find a, a beautiful match in the integration of bringing these selves together and getting on the same page, having a consensus, having a belief in, because it goes way beyond ego or just inner critic. So wow. I said a lot. <laughs> That's beautiful. So I just wanted to see if I understood, <laughs> Tiffany, what you said. Um, so this is a this is a personal self integration model that you're speaking of, and and it's a reflection of of many truths that have been described in many cultures and many different psychology traditions of this idea that the subconscious can be viewed as these multiple selves, these aspects of our consciousness, if you will, that can be brought together. And so in this model, the personal self integration model. You're, I think you're saying the outer self is basically how we interact with the world, like our persona, our, you know, what, where we carry out our work or what we don't, what we do and what we don't. And then, then these other aspects that you say, the higher self, which seems to refer to our spiritual nature, the physical self, which is like our physical body, the astral self, which has to do with our emotions and the mental judge self that has to do with the workings of our mind and our thoughts. And so I think what I'm hearing you say is that if we bring those aspects of our self together and we can think of them as selves there's a process that it sounds like you teach that you know people can integrate those different aspects of their being and somehow by doing that we live healthier more fulfilled lives is is what i'm hearing you say i think yeah. certainly more integrated absolutely more integrated well who doesn't want to be integrated right paul <laughs> Well, yes, th there's the integrated piece, but my mind's going back to what you said earlier, Tiffany, regarding awareness and willingness. So you're saying essentially a big part of the awareness is to have awareness of these selves, because as I've heard you speak before, that our outer personality is really, it's a kind of composite of all these different selves. 
people have their experience of the personality as a kind of a oneness, as a themness. But the fact is, it's a multiple compilation. And depending how familiar you are with the cells or how that, that aspect of the subconscious is flowing together or not, that has a big bearing on the person's experience and way in the world and ability to do things. Is, is, that, is that what you're saying? It is. And if we also bring in, dare I, another concept of in individuation and to have a healthy individuation, meaning to know who we are, to really allow ourselves to remember that we are in, in a unity. But I, I have a very strong belief that before we can really do unity consciousness, we need to sort of unify within ourselves and, and have this um, really a, a willingness for all of our players to play together. Imagine it's like you're a coach of a team and you've got everybody that decides to play the same position or a, a totally like not coherent at all. It's like, wow, what team are they actually playing for? And, and then you are the outer self for like, it's beyond herding cats <laughs> because you've got all of this going on in your head and trying to piece out, well, whose voice is that? Where is that coming from? And to sit into a deep meditation or guided, these are guided processes really, where you can learn the voices, learn their, their way of communicating, learn the personalities because it's what is so amazing is what emerges. To me, that's where the wholeness and the individuation really begins it is not until we have that, that coherent structure within our, our mind and body. I want to continue and chime in here. That, that was such a beautiful description. And, and I'll add, Shamani, I had taken some of the training from Tiffany years ago on this phenomenon about beginning to have more awareness and identifying myself, these different components of my own consciousness. And I remember so clearly there was a point where I got it. I, I had this differentiating awareness spread out and I had simultaneously awareness of these different parts of my consciousness. And I recognized their voices as having always been there, but I didn't recognize them as, I don't wanna say separate from myself, they, they are myself and yet there is a distinction. And as I began to get to know them better and identify who says what, where and when and the influences, honestly, it was very transformational for my day-to-day uh, -day living and sense of well-being. Wow. I mean, because knowledge is power. And thank you so much for sharing that journey, Paul, because I can, I almost felt into what that, what does that feel like when you, when you all of a sudden you're holding all of that, you can, you, you're encountering all of these different aspects of yourself and you can see really clearly where the motivations are going. And then you can kind of hold that. You can actually hold that and, and embrace it instead of running away from it or hiding from it or so I'm being driven by something that I don't understand, right? This is knowledge is power, right? That awareness, it must be very powerful. And I imagine sometimes it's also very painful, right? And this is part of, I guess, what, what you were sharing earlier, Tiffany, is you have to have that willingness, right? You have to have that willingness to sort of go there and embrace. And yet, you know, I'm a clinical psychologist, as you guys know, and I'm, I really also hold the tenderness of where we are you know, as a shared humanity at this point, when so many of us are suffering from really debilitating mental suffering, okay, whether we want to call, we want to label them and call them mental disorders, whatever. Tiffany, I know you work with anxiety a lot. I know we have a, you know, huge onslaught of anxiety at this time, as you know, depression, all these things. And, and yet we have these beautiful tools that are encouraging us to turn toward our suffering and be aware of it and embrace it and understand the root causes, as you say, the the origins of that. And yet, you know, that is sometimes really difficult to do. And so, you know, Tiffany, I'm wondering if you can share with us some of your wisdom, you know, for people that are watching this right now saying, I'm ready to make that change. Like, I'm ready to really fully embrace healing. And, you know, I don't know what my subconscious might be telling me. You know, I think I know. Maybe I do. Maybe I don't. Well, how do I start in this process? What's a safe way for me to begin? Hmm. Yum. Uh, it's a sophisticated topic, you know, to get into 
these areas of selves. And I shied away from it in my private uh, sessions for a while because I was like, I was working with somebody who had multiple personalities, for instance. And I was really afraid to, oh my gosh, I'm going to introduce more sub personalities or more dynamic exchanges within this, this person. But this person, every other system had written her off I, she, I, and she was about to commit suicide and had all the skills and tools to be able to do it. And so we did this work and it was incredibly transformational. I, I kept, I was actually very reluctant. I had my intuition the whole time saying, you gotta do this, you gotta do this. And I was like, no, I, I don't wanna be the responsible one that's gonna fracture her more. But it ended up being the thing that actually made sense. All of a sudden, there was a shift where one side of the mind, you could say, understood what the other one was saying. And there was almost this really beautiful inner compassion. And it, it brings emotion as I say this, because it's to watch that light bulb go on for ourselves as a as self-love, self-love first, that that's where we can transcend any illness. So beyond technique, beyond anything, it, yes, there, there are techniques. Yes, there are those things. And certainly in being a, in a profession, you, you wanna follow certain guidelines. But if you just think about, wow, let me just take a breath of feeling these, these multiple voices that have confusion, that have fear, that have anxieties within themselves, and I'll, I'll say what's interesting that is, that is a common denominator for all subconscious selves. I've never found anything other than this. The deep fear of between being human and our subconscious selves is a little bit different. The core human wound is not lovable and not good enough. The core subconscious wounds are, am I gonna be annihilated or am I gonna be enslaved? And they relate, but the way you would go about worthiness, self-healing, to understand what's really going on more at the depths, then it's, it's an inner conversation. And just to invite ourselves to be able to be really good listeners for ourselves, selves, <laughs> and, and to uh, let them come to the party let them let's let's have a round table let's see who's willing to come let's see who's like hanging out on the edge like ooh, i, I don't know that i i'm willing to be seen here yet but eventually it, it it unfolds and it is mystical and grounded and just it's otherworldly incredible but at the same time i it's really difficult until you have the experience of, of doing this and there are other systems like there's internal family systems that is out there ifs but what i found with those that system in particular and there are other part systems out there they don't all have at least the ones that i've looked at don't have the depth of the spiritual aspects the nature of really who are we as as in in totality and it still focuses more on this kind of archetypal sort of structure, us, them, but who's, who's us and who's them. So this is more of, we all have mental judge selves. We all have astral judge selves. We all have male and female selves. And what do they say about these life experiences that we're having and this exchange that I'm having with another human? Does it feel safe? All of those kinds of things come up. Uh, beautiful. I want to add something. I had an insight while you were speaking back to this awareness piece. I know uh, the tagline of, of, of your uh, business, Heal and Thrive, is know thyself, heal thyself. So uh, the selves really getting in and knowing them, that's, that's foundational to the actual sense of knowing, right? And your, your personal self-integration helps people to get there. I believe. 
I mean, there, there's so many different systems out there. I certainly don't say that this is like the end all be all. It's just one that I found personally very transformational. And I never had the idea that I would, you know, propagate it as a, a teaching or something like that. And, and now I do teach it regularly. And it was always in retreat settings before, but the, because live is so great, but you know, that's all changed for us. So I have actually figured out how to do this online and the transformation has just been incredible. So yeah, this know thyself, and actually I've added to that, it's know thyself, heal thyself, free thyself. Mm -hmm. So the more that we can have those inner explorations, the freer we become. And Rudolf Steiner said, you know, that's the first piece is, is that, that freedom of choice to be able to exercise our choice is our human right. And, and that goes back to lifestyle as well. When you go back to look at those 11 pillars or whatever number you're gonna look at and you go, okay, what choice am I gonna make? And, and it, cause that's the exercise of our own will. And what are we choosing for, for ourselves? Can, can you give us a, just an example, either from an actual client that comes to mind or uh, if you dream one up at the moment, let's say a practical example of somebody who's been having just a recurring problem in their life year after year after year, psychotherapy here, psychotherapy there. There's no resolution. There, there's something internal they haven't been able to get to. And I, I guess I'm hinting at one, it was one of their cells, this aspect of their consciousness that was not really on board and was really mucking up the system, holding them back, just causing the ongoing problems. And, and then doing the therapeutic work helped resolve whatever that issue was with whatever part of their self it was. Can you give us a practical example? I think it would help us um, be able to dig in and understand more. Okay. Um, I'll tell you what comes up, uh, not necessarily a particular person, even though there's one in the back of my mind, it's more about the patterns that emerge having to do very dominant in our society is the mental sphere, right? That we live in a very mentalized world. And so it seems to me that the mental judge selves have sort of been driving the bus for a long time. And what that can feel like to the body is like it's being run over by a Mack truck sometimes. It's like, you know, I, I remember writing my, my master's thesis and it was just like, I had to go to the bathroom so badly sometimes. And I would just totally deny that I had a body because I had to finish this thought and I had to finish this thought. So when we get super mental and super focused, we can drive the body into conditions that are not good. Now that that's not a horrible one, but there are situations that are more where a person will drive themselves into a stroke or a heart attack or these, these conditions that are really, they're really edgy of, they could have made a few switches earlier on to not have that mental drive that was gonna potentially take them out of this world. And what I found the transformation is, is that once the mental judge self realizes, geez, if I kill the host, we're never gonna be able to accomplish the goals. So <laughs> it's really just being able to have the mental judge self also be a part of the journey and not just say, hey, quiet down over there. Cause that doesn't work either. You can't just put a muzzle on parts of ourselves that, <laughs> that have something to say. It's so interesting. And you can zoom this out to the macro level and think about, you know, our systems and how they're being run. You've had some really, really wonderful conversations with folks in the summit, you know, um, Greg Braden and, and Bruce Lipton, who are speaking very much about the same thing, Tiffany, about the, you know, how we're being sort of run by subconscious programming a lot of the time. And where is that information coming from? And is it accurate? And you know, how do we transform our world with the knowledge of who we truly are as human beings and what our human healing capacity really is for healing ourselves and others. And I hear you saying, well, part of that is to accept where we are, like we're kind of in the sphere of the mental judge self. We see that individually and collectively, right? And we can't just all of a sudden put a muzzle on that. We have to harmonize it. As you were speaking earlier about, you know, the selves, I, I kind of Thought you, you mentioned a sports team and of course being a musician my my first thought was a band you know everybody plays different instruments and you don't want to hear too much of one instrument 
because then you can't hear the whole thing, you know, the orchestra, the, the and, and so here you are the person, the integrated person, you're the conductor and all parts are important. And, and, and you know, I know this sort of relates to your concepts of resonance and coherence. And these are words that are kind of thrown out a lot, right? Mm -hmm. So in your view, you know, these concepts of resonance and coherence, how do those play a role in this integration process? I, thank you for bringing that up. I find, well, first of all, because some of these terms are like hijacking physics sometimes, and I really don't mean to necessarily do that, but they are, when we think about physics that tells us about how things are the way they are, it, it, that we can borrow from some of these ideas and concepts, and I think it can be very helpful. So when I'm speaking about resonance, you can see this in the physical world and you can also see it in the emotional world. And in, in much of this, you can't really tease those apart. So what's interesting about resonance is that you can have a resonant thought form, like if somebody starts cussing you out one day, like in, in a, it's actually, actually happening a lot in a neighborhood where I used to live, there were people fighting on corners and all of this sort of stuff. Sometimes those kinds of things land in your person and you can't shake it. Well, why can't you shake it? You can't shake it because there's a resonance. There's something that landed that is meaningful. And that, that little kernel, there's something there for us to unpack because when we do, then we can get to a resolution for why that resonance is giving us that message. And I'm really talking about, you know, the sensitivity of being really aware of our, our environment and not to feel like we're a victim in this world because the, the resonance, nothing can happen to us without our unconscious or conscious permission. And that's the thing to really make that come to our conscious awareness so that we can have a deeper healing over it. it, it is that clear? Yeah, I, I, I mean, to me, what I heard was the principle of resonance, you know, as it applies to our daily lives is, you know, when something sticks to us, when it, why does it, why is it sticking to us? It's sticking to us because there is some resonance there. There is some residue, which of course bleeds back to the subconscious self, right? There's something that the subconscious self needs to express and it's coming out in what we consider sometimes to be a problem, but it doesn't have to be a problem, right? Tiff, it could actually be a very joyful thing, right? Like you could really be, you know, just lit up by something that just happened in your environment or whatever. And that's part of maybe your subconscious self resonating with that, you know, now I'm just making it up, but you hear a great piece of music and your astral self is like, yay, you know, because it could really feel that. So resonance can work in all of these wonderful ways as sort of recognition and as healing. It, well. it's the, it right. is, it, it is actually, it's the, the wound and the healer at the same time, because with, like I said, with the awareness, you can look at something, but you also, it takes resonance in order for that right, literally in, I'm going to use the word frequency, because that's really in, in, when we're using the term resonance, that's what it relates to. And that resonant frequency hits a place where the aha can happen, where the cell gets a shift and goes, oh, I don't have to be sick anymore. Or I, I can choose to die off and, and not cause havoc. You know, so there are, there's resonances to in every aspect of our lives. So there, it's both to pay attention to for healing and also sort of a cause and effect as the wound and the genius wrapped into one thing. There's probably complementarity in there too. <laughs> yeah, as you're both describing that, I kept hearing these words, empowerment and resilience, this phenomenon as you become more into awareness of what's going on and you're putting aside the judgment, for example, in that one case, that's empowerment and resilience. And uh, resilience is something, of course, we all vitally need these days for our health and well-being. Absolutely. And let me just speak to also coherence in that same uh, frame, because to be coherent, we, we talk about is like both parts, two parts of having communication in, in, these, in this framework of, you know, we think about coherence of brain coherence from right and left. We think about 
the gut brain and we think about heart and and brain connections and and coherence and there are measurements for those things and what i was speaking about earlier about the coherence of our inner selves to be able to be at rest to be at peace and not having so much turbulence or chaos where the coherence, it's not like you get a diploma and you hang it on your wall and you're forever coherent. No, this is work. You, you, this is part of always understanding, oh, okay, that took me out of coherence. And now I know what to do to be better attentive to actually what brings me into a more landed, grounded place of feeling coherent in my own body. Mm. Beautiful. Beautiful. So we are at our core resonant, we are coherent, we are integrated, and we're sort of finding our way back to our own garden. Exactly. <laughs> through, through our well temple. Through um, our temple, yes, through our temple. Well, speaking of the temple and, and, and back to the cells and this, this whole inner temple and how it's populated, one of the cells I don't think you mentioned, perhaps I missed it, is the inner child. And oh. I, I know from your point of view and others that that is vitally important to leading a healthy adult life. And can you speak with us about the inner child and your perspective on that and some of the work you've done helping people healing their inner child and what kind of transformation that might have led uh, for them? I, it's so funny you bring this up because I, you're telling secrets. <laughs> this is my version of a personal self-integration. My teacher for this was Harvey Grady, who has roots at the ARE and the Edgar Casey Foundation. In fact, was very early on in integrative medicine and uh, establishing this as a system. And so I'm grateful to he and. Um, uh, Bella Karish and oh, I'm, I'm going to mess up their name, but I can get the sources. They, they got some of this going and I've just developed onto it a little bit more. And what I've added is the inner child. This isn't really new work in, in any way, shape or form. Lots of people speak to inner child, of course. And the relationship to our inner child in from what I've learned and from what my own inner child has taught me through tough means at sometimes, is that our inner child is our first relationship with trust. If we don't have uh, that relationship established, it's actually going to be harder to find that equilibrium and coherence and willingness for the exchange to happen through the inner selves, the subconscious selves that I mentioned earlier. And the inner child, for women, it would be closer to the female self the inner child for men is gonna be closer to the male self. So there's a very tight bond that's there, but it's not automatic. That's not necessarily there just because you want to invite your inner child to come along. It takes uh, awareness and nurturing of that relationship. Some inner child uh, are sort of archetypes are right there and, and ready, willing and, and able. That was not my personal experience. My personal experience was it took um, little Tiffy, she likes to be called, uh, almost two years for her to come out and actually trust me. And you know, she slammed the door in my face and gave me a double barrel. And, and that was my, I was like, what is this? And so it took me years to unpack it. And it was, not, I, I couldn't follow John Bradshaw's work who has very famous, um, you know, a lot of testimonial, very wonderful transformations in people with the, the inner child, Louise Hay. And there are others. I tried to follow that work. My inner child was like, no, we are gonna do things not like that because they got it all wrong in my opinion. So she really schooled me into how, we are to merge. And this is a part of ourselves that we always want to stay the inner child. This is the part of us that is the enjoying the joie de vie of life, the love of life, the, the whimsy, the discovery, the 
uh, ability to be creative and be curious. These are aspects that we always want to be there, whether we're working at a desk job or whether we're writing the, the novella or singing the, uh, the opera of our life. It, no matter what we're doing, we want our inner child to be blended with us because that exuberance and charisma and just divine love comes out in everything that we do. So it's a really important partnership. So thank you for bringing it up. Uh, it was not, it's not in the, you know, sort of written model. <laughs> so well, beautiful. Thank uh, you. If I may, it's uh, my pleasure to bring it up. And I, I'm thinking of uh, emotional healing as a topic. I interviewed Dr. Joseph DeFore um, yesterday, I believe, whom you know, uh, as do you, Shamani. And uh, in his book, Fellowship of the River, and what he had learned in a lot of the Amazonian um, traditional systems, emotional healing and uh, the healing of the emotional body as an energy healing body is foundational to really true healing and well being. And as I recall, um, much of our emotional healing is dependent on really bringing that inner child in us along to a, a healthy state in our lives and paying attention to that. So, as I understand it, and would you agree that? having a, let's say a healthy liberated inner child who's awake and aware and with us uh, in present time really contributes to the capacity that you were just describing. Is that, is that correct? Absolutely, I'm so glad that you brought that up. And I love Joe and his work and what he's doing in the world, it's just fabulous. And that our ancestors and you know he's really connected to people, uh, the Shipibo people and, and many native traditions, and they don't leave the inner child out, right? This is very much this kind of construct of be, do, have, create and push, you know, this kind of mental place. But um, that healing of the emotional healing along with inner child, I, I think it's an imperative part of the journey and it's gonna come up at some point. So it, it re, I, I have not found an exception to that yet. And some people have, have done the work more willingly and other people's are, some people are really afraid of even going to those depths. But it's so rich, it's so beautiful. It's just like, if there's any fear right there, it's just like, you know, jump in because you mentioned the key word, Paul, of liberation, which is really the goal of all of the subconscious selves is to be free and liberated. And what we want as the outer self personality that is helping to make this happen is that we have a cooperation with each other, a shared experience, not an argumentative experience and um, non-inclusive. We want the inclusivity. And I mean, isn't that what most humans want? We want the sense of belonging and the sense of being included in things in life. And if we think about, let's do that for ourselves first, then yeah, then this can represent the outer of the whole and what makes up the planet, but humanity and all kinds of forms of, of life. And I think we could do a much better job uh, being in harmony with our emotions and we'll have much less inner strife and certainly strife out in, in the world the inner to match the outer and the outer to match the inner. Mm, I love that. So the more we find coherence within ourselves, the more we find coherence in the world. Mm. Tiffany, exactly. thank you so much for sharing all of this wisdom. What a journey to explore all of these different aspects of, of who we truly are and integrate them for, you know, as you said, a more empowered life a more empowered life. And the journey is not always easy, but it is the one to take, especially in these times. It's, it's necessary. It's, it's, it's not easy, but it's necessary. You have to do it. And, and it sounds like it can be a very joyful experience too, you know, yeah. with the, the process. And then when, as you say, once the liberation happens, the fun begins. <laughs> It, it's really true. And, you know, when even when they we're in hard times with ourselves, where you're hanging out in some of these places in, in some depths of things that are really uncomfortable for a number of days, it doesn't usually last too long. But then that aha happens. And then so like worlds get opened up of clarity of things that all of a sudden make sense of 
well, that's why I had that experience when I was younger, or this is why my parents are the way that they are, or my whole family unit or whatever. All of a sudden, it all just starts going chit, 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 chit. And you could see the genius of what we wrote into form before we got here. So mm. we put it all into works. So let's figure it out. <laughs> Well, speaking of figuring it out, you know, as many are listening and probably thinking, wow, there, there's a lot that I want to unpack around this. And this has been a great introduction, I think, into personal self-integration and some of your work. Um, where can people learn more about the work that you do? Uh, Heal and Thrive is my website. So healandthrive.com. I, uh, I think there's a couple of things that I'm going to be submitting to shift for some bonuses. So to um, just give people a bit of an experience, a touch of, of what it, what this work is. And I, I do offer free 15 minute consults. And like I said, I've been able to figure out how to do this online. So even better. And um, yeah, there's, there's lots of directions that we can go. Personal self integration is just one area I have found to be, it's sophisticated, it's for the advanced person. Um, and in fact, you actually brought up Greg Braden and Bruce Lipton and uh, Joe Dispenza is another person who speaks on this topic quite a bit as well. And I find that there, it's, it's beautiful and there's an and. And to me, the and is, coming into harmony with these subconscious selves, not just leaving it as this sort of gross, subtle body of the subconscious mind that runs 98% of our operations, by the way. So, yeah. but, you know, really unpacking, what does that mean that our, our subconscious structures? And so hopefully I've given that some meaning and orientation. And there are some resources on my website as well to revisit this. And um, yeah, it's beautiful. It's, wow. yeah. That's great. So healandthrive.com if we want to learn more about you and your beautiful work. And thank you so much for sharing all of this wisdom and experience with us today. Paul, any thoughts, any last words? Yes, uh, Tiffany, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you for all this work you're doing for others. Thank you. Oh, you got, we're all in it together. And I am grateful to have the chance to be able to talk about something that is, this is not mainstream, right? This is, it's the shift network. <laughs> we're doing something that's more in the advanced thinker realm. So I appreciate being able to get to these, these spaces and um, may we go forth in grace. Thank you so much. Mm. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you. And mm. thank you everybody for joining us. Take a care.